So when we went and had a look, we, we looked at the aircraft and we looked at the debris that was collected from the ground. Um, we started to put together a, um, a whole picture. So uh, important things is the damage to the aircraft. So we can see from these diagrams that uh, a number of pieces of debris came out from the engine. We can tell a number came out in these directions by the damage to the aircraft, which we will see. Um, and another bit we worked out, which down here you can see is part of the um, um, turbine, uh, turbine disc. So there was obviously, there was, there was the damage to the engine as we can see. So significant damage in the rear area of the engine, but also in the cowling, and this is the cowling off, a lot of damage down here forward of that, which um, was all fire related damage. So they'd had a fire down in the cowling as well. Um, we eventually worked out that that was um, as a result of oil that was leaking out of the aircraft after the event as opposed to a precursor to it. It didn't last very long and didn't do a lot of damage to uh, anything else, so it fortunately wasn't a hazard to the aircraft. These pieces that we uh, see projecting up through the wing, uh, we can see some images of them here. Uh, we've got one out here which was just punched through the leading edge of the, uh, the wing and this smaller one here, uh, when I say small I'm talking uh, over a foot long, um, as you can see that scale is about 12 inches. And another one here that punched up not only through the leading edge but came through the spar and, and out through the top skins here. Um, those top skins are fairly thick and rather than just peeling it back it just it punched a hole um, through. So these pits, bits were large and uh, moving at quite a, with quite a speed. We also see, saw a part come through the uh, wing to belly fairing, as we can see up there. So another sizable piece has gone through there. Along with, you can see some small bits and there's no photo, but the fuselage in the area was just peppered with holes. Oh, not holes, but little dents. The engine mount itself, uh, the pylon, was damaged. It had severed the thrust links, uh, which take the primary uh, forward force from the engines into the aircraft, and also uh, indentations here on the pylon. So it had been struck by a fairly large piece. But not just structural damage. Through all these areas, uh, lots of systems are running. There was major damage to a number of the uh, wiring bundles. We well, can see the top image was a number of bundles running through the leading edge. So they're, they're attached to the front spar there. So we can actually see that hole I was talking about where the piece went through the front spar. But there were three or four wiring bundles in that that were, were damaged. The lower figure is in the wing to belly fairing. And that's where that piece that we could see went through there and uh, quite cleanly cut another bundle of wires. We had reduced electrical system function. Uh, there were some wires cut and other damage which uh, yeah, of course, um, stopped the flow of electricity through those, but the downstream effects affected some of the uh, AC systems as well. We had a reduced hydraulic system function. We lost, it's got two systems, a green and a yellow system. Um, we lost totally the green system, and there was some reduced function and um, monitoring indication on the yellow system, so both of them were a bit dubious times. And of course we had reduced flight control function. As we can see in that diagram, the uh, yellow and the green indicate uh, the different systems that are uh, powering the various uh, flight control surfaces. Um, the little electrical type symbols, uh, they're also uh, electro-hydraulic backups. So although there's only two hydraulic systems, it's got further redundancy with uh, um, basically electric driven systems. In this detail we can see all the, the red indicates this uh, flight control surfaces that were non-functioning. So all the leading edge uh, high lift devices and some of the uh, trailing edge devices, the slats and ailerons. But unlike the DC-10, there were still quite a number functioning, uh, particularly the elevators and rudders were still fully functional. But despite all that damage, this being a fly-by-wire control aircraft, it's got control laws, digital control laws. The normal law, which it functions in, 
basically all the time, as the name suggests, normal law has a lot of protections in place um, to prevent uh, stalls and uh, unusual attitudes. The system had reduced from normal law to what's called alternate 1A. That's only the first level of degradation. The only thing you really lose in that is a stall protection, an alpha floor uh, protection. So in the aircraft, normally you shouldn't be able to stall it. Uh, in this reduced state, technically you could stall it, but it's replaced with the conventional stall warning. So that's why we saw when they were coming into land that um, they got a stall warning, and that was determined to actually be a real warning. Um, but it was due to the loss of uh, leading edge slats, etc. So there was still margin, but being three feet off the ground, best place to have it. <sighs> Doesn't end there. Engine control. Uh, there was reduced function in the engine control. They didn't have auto thrust, and some of the automated uh, controls in the other engines had been uh, degraded. Um, this included the um, fuel shutoffs for number one engine and uh, you know, high pressure and low pressure shut off, so that was why they couldn't shut down engine number one. Landing gear extension had been affected, that was hydraulic, so, and ran off the green system, so they had to do an emergency uh, um, extension, which uh, I think the uh, Airbus is a gravity extension, you basically let them drop down. Braking, again, linked to the hydraulic system. Um, was still functional, but reduced uh, capability, including a loss of the uh, anti-skid function. Reduced bleed air function. Um, there's a bleed air duct that had been cut in the leading edge. Uh, that's used in a number of areas. Um, hadn't completely gone, but was reduced. Fuel system, well, as we can see, uh, had a hole in the wing uh, where it was losing substantial amount of fuel. Uh, they have a number of fuel tanks in this, so it wasn't a flight critical uh, um, type uh, leak, um, but um, all the same. And also some of the systems from those cut wires, like the fuel quantity management system, uh, had been degraded, so there was difficulty in transferring fuel around, uh, and uh, also the total loss of the fuel jettison system, so they couldn't jettison fuel to reduce the weight. Engine fire protection systems had been degraded, um, there was some loss of functionality, but also loss of indication, so the flight crew could have been activating something, might have activated, they just didn't know. So is it about, are we talking more about an engine failure here then? We can see here again that there's some, some fairly significant damage in that area of a Rolls-Royce Trent 900. Now, I'm, these things aren't insignificant little engines. Um, they are massive. Uh, 79, uh, 76 thousand pounds, pounds of thrust. And that's 70 percent more than the original uh, uh, engines on the 747s. So we'd, you'd like to think of a similar size aircraft but the additional thrust we're getting these days and the size of these aircraft is massive. It's a Trent, but it's still based on the RB211 design, so it's a, a three-spool, a three-shaft um, bypass-type uh, engine, we've got, which has the three, three major components. We've got a, well, systems. We've got a low-pressure system here in blue, an intermediate-pressure system in yellow, and the high-pressure system in red. Now, they, they run basically independently of each other. Um, so they're not connected other than just basically held in the same place by the structure. These modern engines are of modular construction um, so that you can basically pull these, quickly pull these things down into a number of major, major structures, major components. As we saw from this picture from before, we could quite quickly narrow in that the main damage was in this module here, module five, the intermediate pressure turbine. So you can almost not discard, but quickly narrow yourself down into the area of concern and get access to those areas. So if we look at that a bit closer, module five, the intermediate pressure turbine, um, I might say IP turbine every now and then, it's not intellectual property, it's the intermediate pressure. Having a, a closer look at this, just we'll, we'll get our heads around 
the structure in this area before we look at the damage so, so that we can understand a bit more of what we're seeing. So I'll point out some major, major components in there of interest. So we've got, of course, the intermediate pressure turbine itself. We've got the gas flow path. So the engine comes through the engine, out of the combustion chamber, through the high pressure turbine, through the intermediate pressure turbine, into the low pressure turbine. It has structure which comes down and is supported on some bearings and drives the shaft, this shaft, up to the intermediate uh, pressure compressor. So it's, it's, it's providing the, the force to turn the uh, compressor. So it's supported in place by its bearings. The bearings are, again, of course, supported by a hub structure, and that is supported by some external support which holds it all in place and in the centre of the engine. This diagram is useful because it, it indicates a few things including these different coloured areas. These are all areas of different temperature and pressure. They're fed by different bits of bleed air uh, and now we, we term it cool air because it's there for the cooling of the engine um, and the different areas have different uh, cooling needs so they've, they've separated them out. Importantly, we have this, this lighter pink area here, which is the um, cooling air, and it's known as the front cooling air, so the turbine cooling air front. Um, you'll see on some of the diagrams there's a T-car T and a T-caf. Um, so they're, they're just the temperatures in those areas. The yellow area is the rear area, and uh, we've got a different area inside the support structure as well. Now, those area, that air is used for cooling. However, it's still quite hot. It's been bled off the um, compressor section. So as we know, when air gets compressed, it gets more pressure and it increases in uh, temperature as well. And in those areas, it's been compressed so much it can be uh, several hundred degrees. That's not good for oils. Um, so the oils which is lubricating the uh, bearings um, needs to be separated from that. So there's an additional area of cooling called a buffer space in the uh, hub around it. So that hub was made up of two sections. There's an inner and an outer hub. Now all these things will, will make more sense and why we're looking at them later. Uh, there's also a number of seals in the area. These seals are rotating seals and fixed seals, so they're just they're preventing the air from moving one, one area to the other to keep the pressures in. Now that hub and those bearings need to be supplied with oil and air and uh, vented and uh, of course the oil scavenge. So there's a number of um, supply pipes, um, service pipes radiating from the hub. So this is looking at it from from this direction. We're looking in here with some of the panels removed and we can see these these service pipes coming out. That's the, our hub in the middle and as we'll get to later we'll see that the oil feed pipe becomes very important in this whole story. So looking closer in at these service pipes. Now this is this is a view looking basically into into here with a section through. So we're looking forward and we've got the two sections of hub. We've got an outer hub and the inner hub and our service pipes. They were generally attached in the same way which was to penetrate through the outer hub and they were welded into place uh, with an interference fit and a weld in the inner hub. To keep the air in that buffer space there was a, uh, a um, additional ceiling ring in there but otherwise there was there was space around. As we can see in this image, this is like looking at the end of this pipe. That's looking at about that joint there. The way they manufacture them, they have a small section of the pipe in first, which um, is referred to as the stub pipe. Um, so if I'm talking about the stub pipe, it's just that short section on the end. And this shows the clearance that you can see around, around there. The ceiling ring's not in place. So uh, with that rapidly gained knowledge in, uh, in mind, we can now look at the damage that we observed in the engine as we pulled this engine down. A 
Looking here at the, this is the front panel, so this is runs down here of the low pressure turbine. And we see that's the shaft, the end of the shaft for the, uh, which is down here, of the uh, intermediate pressure turbine. The important thing you can see with this, three large, relatively equally spaced holes punched through it. So we can tell at that stage that there were three objects that uh, exited the, air, uh, the engine. Moving to the front, this is the back face of the uh, high pressure turbine. So we can see the, the turbine blades and the rear face of it there. That was had some scoring and heat effect in it and this structure which was wrapped around, it was loose but it was all wrapped around. That was this front seal, what they called the triple seal there. So we can see that that, that had separated and uh, become entwined with uh, the structure forward of it. The only section of disc, well, we've, we recovered some very small fragments, but the only major fra segment of disc that we got, it was about a 40% segment. Um, so quite large segment. Um, and because of that size we could, and where it was found, we could tell that that was, wasn't one that went through the structure of the aircraft. It went off in the opposite direction. Um, looking at the size of it, probably quite fortunately. The key details that we saw on that were these radial fractures and a fracture and distortion of the drive arm. Um, the drive arm comes backwards and around to attach on. It had fractured around there, or the second we, we saw, and had bent up. There was also a, a wear mark, a wear groove around here, and small sections of turbine blades. Um, there were no turbine blades remaining in in the disc. A uh, few were found within the wing and the belly fairing, I believe. Importantly, what we saw is that th none of those fractures had any indication of fatigue. Uh, they were overstressed fractures. Um, so basically, this thing had been loaded up to the point where it just burst. Now, looking here at the, the hub structure and the uh, um, shaft structure, to get our heads around this, um, we have here that's this seal, the remains of this seal at the back here for the low pressure system. We have the, where the drive shaft on the intermediate pressure turbine attaches. A small seal again in front of that, which is located there. And this structure here is our hub structure. And what we can see from that is there's obviously been a breach in the outer hub, and we can see the inner hub structure here. So we're using all this to narrow down. We see that Obviously something has occurred in that area. There's a lot of heat damage uh, in that area uh, and that happens to be co-located with the location of the oil feed pipe. So that, and that makes sense. Yeah, there's a potential fuel source here. Looking in at that, now this is pictures from Borescope at the time, looking in at that, first thing we see is that it's not connected. This is the outer hub and we can see the bottom end of the pipe here and it should be connected into here uh, and there's a small fragment remaining as well. Looking at that inner hub section a bit closer we can see that's the structure of the hub we've got that's the filter, filter body um, actually there was a bit missing in one of the slides I hope I didn't delete that um, Basically, the difference with the oil feed pipe is that there's a filter inserted into it, um, which is, it's a shame I missed that because it's, it's quite important in all this. Um, actually, let's see if I can get back. Ah, I didn't miss it. There. In the end of the, the service feed pipe is a, a filter. Its purpose was just a last chance filter. Basically, if anything got through the normal filters and down to the end, before it got into the um, bearings, they put a, we thought we'll be safe and put a filter in. Um, that filter, to accommodate that, the stub pipes needed to be counterboard out, enlarge the internal diameter um, so that the um, filter body and the filter could fit in there. Sorry, I hate jumping around. So that's what we can see there. That's the, the body of the filter. The filter element itself um, was not found. It had uh, uh, exited the aircraft. So uh, 
we couldn't see if there was anything involved with that. But we were looking closer at this and we saw this, there was a small fragment of the pipe still uh, attached in there. The other end of it, now this is with the stub pipe removed from the engine, we can see some pretty important uh, characteristics on this. Around here we could see the fracture and remnants of the weld. That, that sort of angled area there was actually weld material, so that was where it was welded into the hub. And it also had cracks down here and two types of cracks or fracture surfaces um, in that portion. There was a flat straw coloured planar uh, section and one at about 45 degrees. Now to the materials people, you can look at that near on instantly, you can say, well, it, one's most likely to be fatigue and the other one's overstress. Uh, 45 degrees ductile materials will give a, a uh, 45 degree thing when it, when it fractures in tension. So we're zeroing in on some important information here. So we've got what looks to be a fatigue crack in this area. Often with fatigue you can look under a microscope and you can see all the um, progression marks and unfortunately with this type of material and the situation it was in there was nothing there so you couldn't just go ha ha fatigue so it took a lot of work to get to that point actually. But I remember when I first looked at this the guys actually showed me this photo because I didn't, I didn't get up to uh, um, the site. But I looked at this photo when I was brought in and, and I just went, oh, that's not, that's not right. You can see that lip there. And also, you might sort of see on that, but it's more obvious. Oh, yeah. In this view, which is looking end on, there was significant variation in the wall thickness on that tube from about 1.4 millimetres down to 0.35 in, in that uh, area where the fatigue crack was. So we're just building up, building up the story here to help us, also to help us understand what's going on. Recorded data. Back in the good old days, we used to get five, six parameters if we were lucky on some of the aircraft, and we still do these days. Um, they've got old recorders in them. This aircraft's uh, flight data recorders had thousands of parameters. In addition to that, there's maintenance con uh, computers and that which also record additional maintenance information, uh, engine management systems which record their own data. So we had an absolute influx of data here. Now I won't go into the detail of this because there's uh, lots there, there's more in the report itself, but um, this is the type of thing we're looking at. So we're looking particularly for changes in the data. So we can see a major change here. Uh, that one's just throttles being put forward. So that was the start of the flight. But there was also this major change in this area and we're seeing, looking here at some of the pressures and uh, engine speeds and that in the end, temperatures in the engine. So there was a major change, like some quite significant change at some point. This is looking a bit closer in on some of that data plus some other stuff. So without going into the detail, what we saw was relatively stable and then a group of changes and then significant change. Now these ones are in, of interest because we're seeing the, um, the low pressure, intermediate pressure and high pressure um, systems. These are the speeds they're operating at. So we saw something happen and they just disappeared off the chart. That was for the, high uh, for the low pressure and the intermediate pressure. The high pressure system went on for a bit. N not as well as it was, but uh, continued. And that was important. So putting all of this, all this information together, um, you s we can derive a phase sequence now. I'd like to be able to say that uh, us intelligent people at the Bureau uh, sat down and worked all this out ourselves, but I can't. A lot of thanks and credit's got to go to the, the guys at Rolls-Royce. Um, we worked with them uh, over in uh, England at times uh, on all of this and there were some really dedicated people there and people who aren't there trying to protect the company, um, they're like us, they're just interested in working out what happened and some of these guys were going down to the level of sectioning through and looking at the layers of material that had been sprayed onto areas so they could work out the sequence of things failing as to when, when that metal was sprayed. 
So from all of this, a, um, a sequence was put together. Now the times we're referencing here, we've, we've referenced time zero as being when the intermediate pressure turbine disconnects. So this is uh, the timing involved. So about a minute before, the crack that had been growing in that feed pipe for some time got to a size where it could leak oil out. Now that was down in where, the, uh, where it fits into the, the inner hub. It was leaking out. Now it's under pressure and a fine little leak, so it sprayed it out and it was atomized. Now if you recall, before I was talking about temperatures in there, temperature in that buffer space, which is there to cool it, is still above the auto ignition temperature for this oil. Uh, actually the buffer space is 365 to 375 degrees and these uh, oils have an auto ignition temperature around 208 degrees. So you can imagine what happened. We quite quickly had a fire in that buffer space. Now for illustration purposes there's flame out both sides but the flow of air, it's not stagnant air in there, it's flowing air through there. The flow is actually forward. So this fire was impinging on the, the forward face of the uh, hub structure. At about 10 seconds before the failure, the high pressure turbine triple seal failed. So a lot of heat, a lot of stress in that area from the pressures and it, it failed out so it, it blew it out. The result of that is now we've got a change in all the pressures, balances and that in the engine. So we're now getting even hotter air because it's starting to ingest some from the uh, annulus gas stream. So this is out of the uh, uh, combustion chamber and only through one turbine before it's got here. So it's, it's quite hot. This had the effect though. The primary effect of that was that it reversed the flow in the buffer space. So now we had this fire flaming down to the back and basically what was a blowtorch and uh, so it was quite quickly applying heat down into the seals into this area and impinging directly onto the uh, the intermediate pressure turbine so it's uh, looking at time zero this is a close-up we've got here of if you remember that rear seal and that's where the turbine should attach these holes are cooling holes to allow the air to transfer through and that was the seal in front of it. So you can see it's, it's burnt through that seal. That rough, rough look is actually uh, what we call metallization. so it's a spray of liquid metal onto it. But that of course reduces the strength of the uh, uh, turbine disc structure but also it was removing more of the material so less material, less strength, uh, it had to give way. So what we termed t, uh, time zero, it let go. The disc moves rearwards because of the forces that are on it from the uh, gases. So it, it separated from the shaft, moves rearward and makes contact with the uh, front of the low pressure system. And you can see in that area how we got that groove mark worn into it. Now the intermediate pressure turbine drives the intermediate pressure compressor which has suddenly lost its drive and is no longer delivering air properly to the engine so the engine surges. Now it's only through the balance of pressures and things that we keep gas turbine engines running. Uh, if anything changes they can be quite sensitive, anything changes and particularly something major like the uh, compressor stopping to run, the engine will surge. That pressure balance results in those gases just going out, both ends. And uh, that surge can have uh, a sound like a bang. So that was probably at least one of the bangs that the flight crew heard was the engine surging. Now that wasn't it. For the next four seconds, uh, the, there was still gas flowing through that turbine providing energy to it and it spun up, it accelerated and it was no longer driving the compressor so it was free to spin however it liked. So it accelerated up to a point where the centrifugal forces in it was just such that it built up stresses and uh, it burst. Now typically, and 
the experiments have shown with this that they typically burst into three major components, uh, what they call a, a tri-burst. And uh, that's what happened on this case, and we saw on that rear panel as uh, uh, those three, three holes. So we've matched up where the, the components went out, the parts of the uh, turbine went out. And as I said, I think they calculated that they went out probably at around 880 metres a second. So they were moving. That, that part that we saw was 90 kilograms. So you can, you can just sort of imagine there why, why they consider these things to have infinite energy. Um, I did some calculations of interest in this, that the energy, kinetic energy that that piece had is about equivalent to the energy in a Mars bar. <laughs> so remember that when you're eating a Mars bar. <laughs> So we worked out what had happened in this case. And we of course asked the question, well, did they think of this? Was, was this anticipated? Um, had they looked at this? Well, yeah, they had. Um, they'd done lots of analysis on failure modes and their effects. And they'd actually looked at a case of a, an oil feed pipe leaking into the buffer space, getting a um, fire uh, which basically precipitated in the same way that we saw in this case. So they, they, they knew that this could happen. Now there was no particular safety mechanism to prevent an overspeed of this thing. So when I say by a particular one, there was no control system within there or anything to uh, shut down. Being buried between the low pressure and the high, um, well, and the high pressure systems, it's difficult to get as, as much monitoring in there. But their experience, you know, this is not a new engine type, a new engine design, triple spool engines, they've had a lot of history with them. Rolls-Royce, the world's leader in them, so you, yeah, they, they generally know what they're talking about. So their models and their experience said, well, okay, we haven't got a particular protection on this, but what will happen is that the engine will surge, it won't be able to restart because of the uh, compressor being disconnected, and the engine will shut down. They did the calculations and the, the um, turbine should not have got to its uh, burst speed. So yeah, basically there was just insufficient energy for that to occur. So what happened? Did they get those calculations wrong? You know, why did this one burst? It turns out they're better at design than they thought. The high pressure system was um, so efficient in this case that it managed to recover from the surge, the initial surge. It wasn't running very well, but it, it, it did, did recover somewhat. That recovery added sufficient energy, just that extra amount of energy that the turbine needed to get to that burst speed. This chart's showing the, the design energy profile, well, not energy, pressure profile. So we've got time along the bottom and pressure, uh, delivery pressure at the top there on the side that um, that red line is what they had modelled to occur. So disperse, pressures drop, and then it just runs down. This slow trail off is just the momentum in the system. The blue line represents what was recorded in this event. So we can see it was just a little bit above. Not a lot, but a little. And that was enough to add that extra energy to the disc. So there we go. Is that the end of the story? Um, we now know what happened in quite, quite good detail. So we've worked out how the engine failed. But we also know that the inside diameter of that oil feed pipe looked unusual. If you remember, I was talking about the wall thickness and that looked like an offset in counterboring in there. We also know that there was a feed fatigue crack coincident with that thin wall. So we need to look at this a bit closer. We have to first determine, it might seem obvious, but first you've got to determine, was that why it cracked? You don't want to go down the wrong path. You want to understand the situation fully. And also, should it have been like that? It looked unusual to me, but it may have been acceptable. Should it have, should it have been like that? So they looked in quite detail at, at, the, at the cracking. Rolls-Royce did some pretty detailed um, finite element analysis on this uh, stub pipe. And we can see here, the, um, this is well, the hole of the pipe. And this is a zoom in on that area. 
that's the high stress. The red represents high stress, graduating down to a blue uh, low stress. That highest stress point is quite small and happens to be just under the lip where the oil feed pipe fits into its interference uh, hole in the hub. We also, they also did some good modelling and found that there was a good correlation between the wall thickness and the stress. Again, for an engineer it seems like a bit of a no-brainer, but you, you've got to make sure of these things to, that there's not something unusual happening. There was also a correlation between the orientation of the thin wall, so that you could, that thin wall could theoretically occur anywhere around that pipe. This line that they've got here represents it in its worst position, so that that thin section lines up with the highest stress point. The one that failed wasn't in its worst orientation, um, so if it had been, it probably would have just failed earlier. There was also a good correlation between the wall thickness and the fatigue life. Uh, engineers will know that, or well, most people would be able to understand that um, the higher the stress, the more quickly something's going to uh, fatigue. So we can see a number of points along here for different wall thicknesses. This is a logarithmic chart, so you know, that's 10 times that, which is 10, you know, 10 times each time. So for reductions or increases in wall thickness, you get a significant increase in the life. Um, out to the 0.91 uh, was what the design had anticipated that the uh, wall thickness should be. So you can see it was you know, over 100,000 or 200,000 uh, uh, flight cycles, which is basically should have been acceptable for the life of the aircraft. So in answer to that question, did it crack because of the thin wall? In a word, yes. But should it have been like that? Was it acceptable for it to have been thin like that? Should it have been offset? Well, to look at that, we've got to go back and look at the manufacturing. So we looked at the, des uh, the design drawings. Well, first of all, even before the manufacturing, we looked at the design. Had they designed it? How, had they designed any flaws into it? So we're looking at the manufacturing drawings. These are two views at 90 degrees to each other. That's before the stub pipe is put in. That's after the stub pipe is put in. Important feature on that, well, these aren't the actual drawings. These are drawings I did of representing their, their material to highlight the important bits. But the important bits was this datum AA. So all of the holes in this were referenced to that datum hole and had the same axis. So they have tolerances on them, of course. You can't expect them to make it perfectly, so you have acceptable tolerances. But ultimately, everything should line up. All of these diameters, including the counter boring on here, which was referenced to AA, should, within give or take, be within a straight line. So really, it wasn't a design problem as such in itself. So how did this occur? Yeah, it should have been pretty much centered, give or take. So this may appear to be a, a manufacturing issue. So we had a look at the manufacturing drawings. They're different and they'll produce a different set of manufacturing drawings to the design drawings because the design drawings define what it is. But you can't, in a situation like this, you can't manufacture parts. It's, it's a staged manufacture, so you need to produce a new set of drawings for that so that different operations have different drawings. So what did they show? Was there anything on the manufacturing drawings? All pre looked pretty much the same. Um, represented slightly differently, but um, everything was there. We got datum AA. But the slight difference was this datum M. It was a new datum, wasn't on the design drawings. And this datum M was this inner hole here, a, uh, some counterboring that was done in the uh, inner hub. And we'll get, to, we'll get, we've worked out, we'll get to why that was. So we looked at the manufacturing because all those holes, even using datum M, datum M was aligned with datum AA. 
So everything after that should have been aligned as well. So it should still be in the middle. So we need to look at how these things are manufactured. Is there anything in there that could tell us uh, what, what had occurred? So a little bit on the manufacturing. It's a multi-stage. They don't just stick this thing in and, and uh, go and uh, machine it all in one go. It's put into well, uh, basically a blank, which has come from another process. It's put into uh, a jig to hold it in place before it goes into a computer mill. The first step is mach all machining from the outside. So these are clamps, they, they weren't there, they were put on later. Um, but there was this, it was clamped using this plate. And that just holds it all down in place, it stops it from moving while they, uh, um, manufacture, or while they do the machining. So they drill the holes through. And this is, the first one to go through is datum AA. And then there's some spot facing and drilling from the outside. They're drilling onto the inner hub from the outside to put in this, what we termed the interference bore. Now that's where the, the fuel feed pipe um, fits in. It's an interference fit plus the welding. So they machine all that from the outside. This timing pin is an important feature which is used to orient it in the jig. So first thing they do, they put it all in and they set it up and they set the machine up from that timing pin. So that orients everything. They then, once that's finished, they take it out of that machine. They take or reclamp it. They clamp with these external clamps around the outside of the hub and remove the timing pin and its structure so that they can get access to machine from the inside. Uh, there's a couple of hours worth of machining in there that they machining all the surfaces for the uh, the bearings and the support and that. As part of that, they would machine the uh, inner countersink there, which we saw before was used as datum M. Third stage is that they put the pipe in, and then they'd weld it in place. And then amongst some other machining, the fourth stage was the counter boring. So they'd again set it up, put it into a, uh, uh, another machine, uh, another mill, and set it up, referencing off this new datum, datum M and counter bore, which was a two stage, um, a rougher bore, which was for the, the um, fuel filter, enlarge it for that, and then what was called the uh, fine limit or a high tolerance. Uh, counter bore to fit the body into because you want a nice neat fit to fit the body of the filter into so that it wasn't leaking oil past. But as I was saying before, all these things should align. So shouldn't that still put it in the middle of the uh, uh, the feed pipe? Why would we see it off the side? What went wrong? Well the main answer that was worked out was movement during the machining. The uh, Parts with that change in the clamps, so when they do that, that could could induce some movement. Uh, during the machining, stress relief of the part, they, they actually measured some the, the parts moving slightly while they were machining and they put that down to stress relieving in the material as it was removed. And also your tolerances, um, they can build up. Uh, particularly if you're referencing through multiple datums. And this was primarily occurred between stages one and two. So this is really occurring before the stub pipe was even inserted. And what that movement did, it was, it lost the connection really, the physical connection between datum AA and datum M. So these two datums that they were using were now no longer connected to each other. So you couldn't say that, yes, it was going to be nicely aligned because of that follow through effect. So we'll have a little bit of look at the effect of the movement. The, that surface that was used for datum M, that inner counter bore, that was done in the second stage after the change in clamps, after several hours of machining. So it was, it was bored. Now, it might have thought it was in the right location, but it was no longer in the location that it thought it was. It was slightly offset from, in particular, the interference bore. Now, that's important because that interference bore is where the pipe is located. So that dictates where the pipe is. So we've got an offset in the axes there. So when they come to doing the counter bore in that final stage, um, 
the axis for this datum is now different to the axis of the pipe. Um, so of course we can see that's uh, going to affect it, offset, reduce the wall thickness. So we're getting closer, we're getting to understanding how this all occurred. And what about quality control? This is Rolls-Royce, the Rolls-Royce standard of quality systems. You know, it's, a, it's a saying that everyone in society knows. How could these guys get it wrong? They had some of the most sophisticated measuring equipment there, these computer-controlled measuring machines, running off automated programs, providing automated reports which told you when there were non-conformances, where there were errors. So why didn't it get detected? Why didn't they detect that these things? And this is the next question. Why were they letting stuff out which had these thin walls? Well, the measurements that they were taking, when, you, when you're making a part, you should be confirming that it meets the design. The design is what you're trying to make, so you want to make sure that it meets it. So that's what you're inspecting for. But not all the features were referenced to the design drawing. What the... Um, manufacturing engineers had realised is that once you put the stud pipe in, you can't measure datum AA anymore. There's just not the room to get the uh, equipment in to uh, measure it, or to measure from it to set your datum. So that's why they used datum M. So they realised that, oh, well, we'll put this other datum in, uh, it's aligned, we'll make sure that it's aligned with datum AA at that point. But they didn't understand the movement. But when they were measuring it, they were also using these manufacturing datums to measure from. And in particular, this applied to the uh, um, features in the uh, counterbore. Um, it might be, you think it might, it might be quite obvious looking in there that uh, you just, all you need to do is have a quick look in there and you'll see if it's majorly offset. Well, of course of the manufacturing process, when they weld it in, that covers the end of your pipe. So even though it might be offset slightly in there, you know, you're only talking fractions of a millimetre, but uh, you can look in and you can't see that one wall's thinner than the other because all you can see is weld. So even fancy measuring machines and the Mark I eyeball um, weren't detecting it. But during manufacture we found that some non-conformances were identified and uh, they, um, then they were reported. They have a system for reporting non-conformances where they fill out a sheet and that goes to the design engineers and other engineers as required stress analysts and, and that to uh, determine if it's still okay to use. Okay, it doesn't conform to the design drawings but it may still be okay to use or it might need repair, etc. So they were reported, design engineers assessed it, but the manner in which they get reported, they'll just say this drawing, like the design drawing, this reference non-conforms by this amount. So the design engineers look at that and they go, oh, well, from, from datum AA, this feature is out. That feature was the interference bore. But what they had measured was that the location of that interference bore from the datum M, which was in a different spot. But the design engineers were told that it was, were basically told that it was to datum AA. So they looked at it and went, oh, well, that could be a problem. We might have an interference problem between the pipe and the outer hub. So go measure them. If they're within these tolerances, good to go. Nobody made the connection of what happens down the lines. Well, the design engineers didn't even know about the additional datums. So they measured them, all was good. None were rejected because of that. But when you consider, you know, look back at the design, or well, the manufacturing method, that holes, those holes were drilled from the outside for datum AA, so they were gonna line. So is this the story? Have we finished there now? To the ATSB? Yes. Ooh. Well, still a little more to it. It's a story of missed opportunities. Um, started off saying that we don't go out there blaming people. Um, we're just trying to learn the lessons from this and uh, telling, getting that message out so that those that had the uh, errors happen to them can improve their systems, others can see it. We report publicly so that other people, organisations can learn the same lessons. So we don't blame. We look at opportunities for this to have uh, been prevented and there are a number in there. 
And it wasn't just about them making them, but also about them getting into service and remaining in service.